Like many of you, I've been thinking about Star Wars. Here we are at the end of the Skywalker saga. It's been nine movies, countless books, video games, toys, and even holiday specials. But we've probably spent just as much time loving these movies as we've spent arguing about them. I say Phantom Menace sucked more. I say Attack of the Clones sucked more. Everyone's got a take. Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? And we've read a million think piece essays, watched a million pedantic videos like this one. And even then, I just still have one question. Why? Why have we been talking about this franchise for 43 years? That's a crazy long time for anything to be this relevant. So why has it managed to strike a chord? Why was that first movie able to create a massive, sprawling narrative universe? Which makes me think, maybe we should make the question even simpler. Why does Star Wars work? It's so easy to take the film for granted these days. It's something most people have seen many, many times over the course of their lives. And we don't think so much about its construction as we do its impact. But even then, the real answer doesn't lie in the storied history of the film's production, nor its groundbreaking special effects, nor the creative inventiveness of a world full of droids, lightsabers, and space magic. It works because of its dedication to basic story mechanics. And no, for the last time, I'm not talking about Joseph Campbell and the Hero with a Thousand Faces. The truth is that book has far more to do with the commonalities of anthropological symbols than it does good screenwriting. The movie doesn't work because it apes the basic tropes of a genre. It works because it sticks to the tried and true methods of storytelling. Because you have to remember, there's a point where everyone sees this film for the first time, where they don't know everything about lightsabers or Wookiees or the technical specs of Boba Fett's Slave 1 and Slave 2, look, I was a huge nerd, but looking at what the audience absorbs during that first watch is critical to understanding how we all fell in love with it in the first place. And as we go through the story scene by scene, put yourself in that place. Go back and reimagine that you are watching Star Wars for the very first time, because it's there that you will discover why it works. Now, a lot of people divide films into act breaks, but contrary to popular opinion, stories can have lots of act breaks, and there's always a different amount of them. So rather than try and cram everything into act breaks for the purpose of this, we're just going to break movies down by their sequences. Cool? Cool. Here we go. Sequence 1. In Media Res. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away... The first title card really is this amazing thing because it's actually communicating so much with so little. The phrasing evokes a fairy tale, this fantasy-like nature of the story. It prepares the viewer to be transported and then... Immediately, you're hit with grandeur and bombast. Then the title crawl comes and look, we know Lucas was trying to evoke old serials he watched as a kid, but don't think about the references. Think about it in terms of story function alone. You're being thrust into the middle of the story, or en media res as we call it, and I have no idea how to pronounce that. But the opening title crawl is, well, it kind of seems like a lot of information, no? The first time you see it, you won't have it memorized, so all it's really trying to convey is three important pieces of information. The first is context. We come to understand that one, we're in space, and two, there's a rebellion happening against an empire. That's enough, we can understand that. The second is the MacGuffin aka the thing the two sides are fighting over. In this case, there are stolen plans for a super weapon called the Death Star. This will be what drives the plot. Third is the current objective. A character named Princess Leia is running with those plans to get them to a rebel base. With those three bits of info, that's really all we're communicating, and we're ready to go. We start with an iconic shot. It communicates so much, not just the size and scale of what we're looking at, but characterizes the two sides in question. We have the big awful empire chasing the little guy rebellion. The odds already feel insurmountable. A laser fires and bam, it looks awful. The sense of danger is immediate. So from the explosion, we make the perfect cut and go right inside the ship and see them shake. This is the simple kind of cause and effect I'm talking about. Yes, this is good storytelling. You'd be shocked how many films don't understand this and just stack the whiz-bang shots on top of each other without even thinking about cause and effect. So now we're meeting our two droids. Man, is this a bizarre and brazen way to start the movie. We have C-3PO, an awkward talking robot that expresses fear and hopelessness. Be destroyed for sure. And we have R2-D2, a tiny trash can that's beeping out shit we don't understand. 
These are our entry points to a grand epic space story. But this choice actually does so much. It throws us into the weird, otherworldly sci-fi nature of this universe. It shows the lowly beings being thrown into the middle of a massive war. And most importantly, it gives us two goofy characters that we kind of like immediately, precisely because we empathize with them in their situation. These two characters are in grave danger. Boom! Oh no, the Empire is boarding! The two sides ready for battle. Laser fire goes back and forth and we see people dying on both sides, which sets a sense of danger and stakes. And so, we worry more for our two droids. And what's their first terrifying goal? They have to get across a hallway. That's it. And they actually managed to get through with this hilarious shot of them somehow not getting hit by gunfire. But don't just dismiss this. Think about what they're doing in terms of setting tone here. It establishes a notion of odd luck with these two, but it's also telling you something about the people making this story. That there's a sparkle of wit and humor and awareness of convention. It seems little, but it's actually really important. But just when our two droids make it through, the Empire wins the gun battle and enter Darth Vader. Now, understand, in 1977, no one knows who this guy is. He's not an icon, and we certainly don't know how he's related to anyone. So all we have is the immediate information. Right now, we just see this huge, towering bad guy in a black leather outfit coming in through the fog. We just know he has a deep, machine-like voice, and he's bossing people around. Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive! For the new audience, he immediately reads bad guy in charge. And so, our sense of fear grows. We then cut to a hand putting in plans into R2. Now, this is actually where the opening title crawl becomes critical, because now we have enough information to guess at what's really happening here. We see a woman in white, and we know this is probably the princess hiding the plans in R2. Thankfully, we don't have to stop and explain it now. We can just move at the pace of the story and use visual language alone. Now, this also achieves a really important thing which is transforming the Death Star plans into an actual character, R2-D2. Which is smart because the best MacGuffins are always people. Instead of it being some meaningless object that's getting passed around like a dagger or a wayfinder, the object itself is now this little, inscrutable, goofy asteroid. Which is perfect because you want to get conflict out of dialogue and people's behavior. And to finish this sequence, we have a new objective. R2 has to get the plans to safety. Luckily, they barely escape from gunfire just as Princess Leia is taken hostage. They will have to find a way forward. Somehow. Some way. Sequence 2. On their own. So after all that, after that entire sequence, now we finally get our first big dialogue scene with conflict. This is our first tete-a-tete where two characters face off against one another and more importantly have conflicting objectives. Vader thinks he has what he wants, which is Leia captive and the Death Star plans within grasp. Now she is my only link to finding their secret base. Meanwhile, she's denying and lying, trying to buy her droids more time. I don't know what you're talking about. Believe it or not, this is the core of drama. Most of the scenes in this movie are just someone trying to convince someone else to do something they don't want to do. I can't tell you how much this is the backbone of so many good stories. It's why every legal show or chamber drama works on TV. It's also why suspense and popcorn movies work. But in this scene, Leia isn't gonna budge, so Vader just has her taken away. Now this is what we call a moment of dramatic impasse. It's where two characters reach a state of disagreement, and thus one character is gonna move on and try and solve it another way. Now, something to be aware of is that if you have way too many moments of dramatic impasse, it creates a grating feeling because it means you're just playing the same conflict over and over and over again without any real change. Now, the scene could have ended there, but it's going to actually follow up on the conflict to further the audience's understanding of the situation. This arguing officer lays out the idea that the Empire is currently doing things that could have grave consequences. Word of this gets out, it could generate sympathy for the rebellion in the Senate. He also lays out the Empire's understanding of her commitment to the rebellion. She'll die before she'll tell you anything. But Vader's not worried. Which just shows his character's hubris. Leave that to me. And when he learns that an escape pod has been jettisoned, he realized she must have hidden the plans inside. And thus, he has a new target. We therefore transition right back to our plans, aka the droids themselves. But now, we know someone is also hot on their trail. Now this may seem inconsequential, but we actually get two important beats in this scene. 
First is C-3PO's characterization. At this point, we get his general ethos and sense of self-pity. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. Meanwhile, R2's determined to go off on his mission, certain of himself, and heading towards a literal rocky place. But C-3PO is mad at R2. He's mad at him for the whole damn situation. He's fed up. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted know, scrap pile. So he decides to split up and go off the way he wants to. Again, we've already changed the nature of the conflict and alliances. But oh no, C-3PO realizes his decision immediately sucks. He doesn't take it well. That malfunctioning little twerp. This is all his fault. Which is also something R2 didn't actually do. But there's not much time for moping, because hey! A transport! I'm saved! Meanwhile, R2's decision does actually seem like the wrong one. There's this scary tone that creeps in, and there's a real Lost in the Woods vibe. Maybe 3PO is right, we wonder. The little yellow-eyed creatures stalk him, and it's like a horror movie. Then they jump out and get him, oh no! Then the scene does a really interesting thing. It completely changes tone. First with R2's reaction. But then note the way the scene suddenly feels lighter and sillier, especially with the music. With that moment, we realize these little goofy guys are really just capturing him. These sorts of tonal changes are actually important in storytelling, because you don't want to hit the audience with the same constant feeling over and over again. You can't just have everything in a tense rush as people crack wise and run across the screen. You want them to go through feelings that really change. More importantly, you want the audience to feel what the characters are feeling. So even in these short scenes, you're changing what the audience is feeling. There are these positive and negative exchanges that guide the emotion of the story. And even with that, the emotion of the story changes yet again. R2 is dropped into what feels like robot purgatory, an island of misfit droids all lost and alone. I love how little about the scene is actually explained because we don't need to explain it. It's better if we don't. We just have to feel what R2 feels, and then the feeling changes again. Because 3 is here, and they're just so happy to see each other again. R2D2, it is you! It is you! Now you may wonder, what's the point of this? They separate and get back together in like two minutes of screen time? Well, it not only lays the foundation for an important moment that comes later, it demonstrates that even though these two characters disagree, they realize it's important to stick together. And it's something that's gonna pay off later. We call this kind of stuff moments of dramatic synthesis. And they're the opposite of dramatic impasse. It's when two characters resolve their conflict and make a deal that effectively pushes them into a new, different form of conflict. But now with a better sense of understanding. The fact that these two characters don't have to verbalize this understanding? That's the entire point. We understand it through the dramatization itself, which is far better than anything told to us with mere lip service. Remember, dramatization makes the audience understand a character's behavior far, far more than if they explained it. And the fact that this conflict and synthesis are done so quickly is important because you don't want to belabor it. You don't want to hang on to it. You want them to get to their point of dramatic synthesis so the movie can press on, especially because stormtroopers are still hot on their trail, complete with bad 90s effects. God, the special editions are just... <sighs> but still, the important thing about this scene is that it leads to the Empire understanding that one... Someone was in the pod. And two... Look, sir, droids! Now the enemy has an objective. Back with 3PO and R2, things look bleak. The droids prepare to be lined up. They fret being melted down. They fret the Empire. They fret everything. The dread creeps in. But little do they know, they're about to meet their salvation. Because they're about to meet a goofy farm boy. Sequence 3, The Homestead. At 17 minutes in, we're introduced to the great Luke Skywalker. Now, note the way we haven't been introduced to him beforehand. There's no cross-cutting to this farm boy waiting for something to happen down below. Because that's just ineffective storytelling. Because all it does is make the audience go, gee, I wonder how he's going to end up being involved. Which is actually super boring for an audience. Instead, we've been following the action of the story itself. We've been following the Death Star plans. And now, Luke shows up organically when he comes into the story and comes across the droids. Which also means he gets the best introduction possible. Ask yourself a question. How does Luke Skywalker become an icon for millions of young children? How is he so immediately important to us? Is it because he's brave? Super strong? Endlessly cool? Does he save a cat? No. 
he's told to do his chores. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. You can waste time with your friends when your chores are done. That's right. People make these kinds of false assumptions all the time, thinking that you need to demonstrate likability or some other nonsense. But empathizing with a character's cruddy situation is far more powerful in getting an audience to relate to a character. It's having someone get stuck in traffic or spill coffee on themselves. It's looking at those situations and going, man, I've been there. And for kids, there is nothing that they could empathize with more than having to do their chores when they want to hang out with their friends instead. Stupid adults. But this scene is doing so much more than just introducing Luke. It's also playing on our heartstrings so effectively. We just demonstrated that we don't want R2 and C-3PO to get separated anymore. But it makes us quickly believe that they will. And because of what we just saw, C-3PO now sticks his neck out for R2. Excuse me, sir, but that R2 unit is in prime condition, a real bargain. And so the two of them are put safely in the care of Luke. Even on a plot level, it demonstrates the logic that these droids can be stopped with those little, uh, this is still, so the power thingies, the, th the things that make them stop, what are those? I don't know. But also think of what we've seen in this film so far with its deep sense of world building. We've seen starships and princesses and lords, and now we're here with junk traders on moisture farmers on the other side of a barren world. We've seen the highs and the lows of the galaxy, and more importantly, we've seen them in organic fashion through the eyes of these two goofy asteroids. Also, this comic beat always slays me. Hey, what are you trying to push on us? Okay, so we start the next scene with Luke and he's still being the kid surrogate because we are literally watching a high schooler play with a model fighter as if he's a toddler? But it's not just the kid-like enthusiasm. It's the fact that he feels stuck on his farm. Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. Again, we feel for his situation. He's impatient yearning for so much more. Like the young kid who wants to leave his small town and go somewhere else. But it's all so far away from this cruddy place. Well, if there's a bright center of the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. But then, the tenor of the scene turns to a little bit of hope. Luke learns that these two droids were part of the rebellion, and he even stumbles into the main part of the MacGuffin when R2 plays a bit of the message. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. What's this? Okay, now this is where the story also has to get a little plotty. Maybe needlessly so, but it still works. First, it's because R2 is not playing the entire message. This is largely because the audience doesn't need to know all that information right now, and neither does Luke, to be honest. But they at least ingrain his wanting to hear more, which is a curiosity that will hopefully sustain the audience for, oh, another 15 minutes or so. The only important part of the message is how it's meant for Obi-Wan Kenobi, who might be related to someone Luke actually knows. Obi-Wan Kenobi. I wonder if he means Old Ben Kenobi. It's enough of a lead for them to go on. This is where R2's cleverness comes into play. He convinces Luke to remove the restraining bolt just before dinner, and now he could theoretically get away. Everything we've just seen is so quick and complex, but it's all important table setting for what comes later. But now, we have a quieter scene of character work. But notice it's still grounded in argumentation and characters trying to convince each other. Luke wants to leave the farm this year, but Owen wants to keep him there for practical needs. Harvest is when I need you the most. They also talk about Ben Kenobi, and there's so many things going on here. Knowing looks, illusions that set up a sense of history. I don't think he exists anymore. They set up the belief that Ben is just some crazy old man, but they also set up a sense of yearning to know more about Luke's father. You mean my father? The scene ends with Luke wanting to go off to the academy, but instead, his uncle just gives him another chore. It's another moment of impasse. All Luke can do is storm off. But the following four-line scene is so important, too. Owen and Brew have just had a moment to show they're not monsters in the slightest, but humans who actually care about Luke. Brew muses that he's stuck, that most of his friends are gone. Owen listens and even promises to make it better just later on. With all those emotions and feelings lingering within us, we then transition and get one of the most iconic moments in cinema history. The twin sun shot, complete with the perfect music cue. This is the real power of cinema, because there's no words that I can offer that would be so achingly beautiful we just have the music and the emotion and the performance. But there's a reason this is so iconic beyond the beauty of its execution. This moment works 
because of the scene prior. The scene where we just got all the information we need to understand this character's interiority. That is the emotional and psychological space of where they are at the moment. Luke? He's a young boy who looks off to the horizon and a world beyond. No, he's not a farmer. He wants so much more. But for now, he has to hang his head. The stars will have to wait. But for an immediate change of emotion, Luke returns to the garage and learns that everything has gone wrong. R2 went off by himself. Luke argues and frets with 3PO. It wasn't my fault, sir. Please don't deactivate me. Again, all the scenes are about conflict. They search the horizon, but it's too dangerous to go at night. They'll have to wait till morning, and we worry deeply. But think about the importance of the sequencing here. For Luke, it's just a new droid. But for 3PO in the audience, we've watched this little trash can stumble forward in pursuit for the last 20 minutes. Again, you can never just assume empathy. You have to dramatize the reasons for us to care. So the next morning comes and they go after him. But immediately, there's danger. These scary dudes with bandage wrapped faces are on their trail. Are they mummies? They might be mummies. They could be mummies. We don't know. Quickly, they find R2. By the way, I love the implication that R2 has just been taking these little baby steps all night. Yeah, it's amazing. But immediately they read that sand people might be close to them. Luke thinks he's being careful and scouting out from a distance, then BAM! I love this moment. Precisely because it's the kind of thing we rarely do in action storytelling anymore. We're not sitting back and just observing cool action that some poor, overworked VFX artist had to construct with no real direction. These are moments constructed in the mise-en-scene? My French is terrible. Mise-en-scene! These sorts of moments were written and planned for and constructed as great reversals and surprises and people getting the upper hand on one another, all for great dramatic effect. And just when you think the sand people have the upper hand, they hear a strange noise and see the most terrifying saint in the world, an old man stumbling. Okay, it's hilarious, but the situation communicates the right things, right? Because one, it is an old stumbling man, and two, even if the noise was some trick, <laughs> that old man is still someone to be feared. Also go back to 1977 and remember that this is your most famous actor in the film. Alec Guinness is a name that lends genuine class to the proceedings, and most of the audience will recognize his stature. So we get this great little reveal where he pulls back his hood and there he is. But beyond the metal lair, it's also a great introduction to his character. He's old, cautious, warm, and kind. He listens and even laughs off the idea that he's not dead yet. Oh, he's not dead. Not yet. And even in terms of plot, he actually doesn't know what R2's talking about. But rather than dwell on it, they have to get poor 3PO out of the way and get on the move. Which is smart because it actually allows you to divide up the exposition of the scenes. It's also crystallizing something with 3PO. You go on, Master Luke. There's no sense in you risking yourself on my account. I'm done for. Yeah, 3PO's a big-ass drama queen, and I love it. So then we sit down for some good old-fashioned exposition time. Now, looking back on the scene, it's very easy to get caught up in the lore of everything, the historical details, and judge the scene on how it will become important to later movies and all that. Yeah, I don't care about that. That's because lore, which is all the history and logic and left-brain film watching, I get that a lot of people like that stuff and it technically helps in world building, but it's such a small piece to building drama, and sometimes it's even an obstacle to it. Because you have to remember, in 1977, People don't know what those proper nouns meant. They weren't taking notes on Luke's father's job, or the Clone Wars, or how and when he knew Uncle Owen. No, they just felt the emotion of the scene. They felt Alec Guinness's sense of warmth towards Luke. And they understood that Luke was realizing for the first time that his father was a more important part of the world than he thought. He also gets to feel sad that his uncle kept it secret from him. But now he's starting to feel kindness and encouragement seemingly for the first time. I understand you've become quite a good pilot yourself. He also gets his introduction to the film's main villain, Darth Vader. He learns that it was this man who killed his father. He learns of a force called the Force, and it's not specific. It's vague and mystical enough that we get some idea of its scope without having to resort to science or direct explanation. And then when we have that understanding, R2 finally plays the entirety of his message. Again, it's a lot of plot details, but the important part is simple and objective. Leia needs Ben to get the plans to the rebels on Alderaan. And immediately, 
Obi-Wan begins convincing Luke to come with him to Alderaan. Luke always dreamed of escaping, but this? No, this, this is too much. He wants to help, but he also doesn't want to abandon the people who rely on him, and so he resigns himself. Such a long way from here. Now this is that famous refusal of the call you hear so much about in storytelling, but honestly, it's often something that's poorly used. It can't just be some perfunctory fear thing, because much more important than the denial itself is us genuinely understanding Luke's struggle. We know how much he worries and fears his uncle's wrath, all of which has been demonstrated dramatically through the story already. So he must say no, we know this. But the guilt lingers in him. But it's right in that moment of impasse that we have to cut across the galaxy. To the Death Star! Finally, we see it. And note the way they introduce us to it, by showing us a sense of scale of the huge ship we saw before and now, something that dwarfs that ship in terms of scale. Also note the way we make it 36 minutes into this movie before they reveal it. Why? Because they don't need to do it any earlier. I never understand why movies are in such a rush to show us things or get bits out of the way early, like, they think they have to introduce everything. Honestly, it's boring and perfunctory. Most of the time, you can just guide us through goals, objectives, and conflict in clear and dramatic way, and the audience will be interested. That should be the bigger lesson. But now that we're seeing the Death Star, we go right into the boardroom, which is one of my favorite little exposition scenes in cinema history. I say this because exposition is only really boring if you're trying to have one character explain something to another. Instead, here we get two characters arguing in conflict, aka trying to convince each other, about whether or not the rebellion is valid. There's one guy, fearful, seeing the rebellion as a threat to the station. The other, he's ego-driven and cocksure. I don't know about you, but I love these two stodgy jerkwads. And it doesn't matter that we never see them again. Now a lot of people will tell you it's bad screenwriting when a character never shows up again. And look, it kind of is. But it's not like it's this ongoing habit in the movie, so it's still better than cramming these guys in later for no discernible reason. More importantly, they set up a great scene turn when Vader walks in with Grand Marf Tarkin, and this is important because it establishes that this dude is actually kind of Vader's boss. Moreover, it allows us to establish Vader's absolute calm, terrifying badassery, as well as his own capabilities with the Force. I find your lack of faith disturbing. The other reason the scene is so important is because it humanizes the Empire. Again, that doesn't mean it makes them likable. What it does instead is it makes them feel like a bunch of realistic people who aren't just some monolithic institution that thinks the same thing. In reality, they're politicians and petty squabblers. This is why we spent all this time talking about the Senate and all these things that we never explicitly saw in the movie. This is really the good kind of lore, because it's not about like history and fact. It's something that makes the world feel lived in, which is especially important when they start making threats. We will then crush the rebellion with one swift stroke. So right as the Empire threatens carnage, we transition to see the carnage they are capable of. Alas, we see the poor jaw was slaughtered, and again we get this version of the Empire that is trying to hide its malice. In a way, this makes us hate them more than if they were just blindly powerful and acting with impunity. Psst, this is a lesson the series is gonna forget later. Oh! to the first order! But here, Lucas seems to genuinely care about the thematic weight of this stuff. He's actually interested in the sneaky, underhanded ways that fascism comes to power and displays that power. And because they killed these Jawas, now Luke is terrified that his surrogate parents could be in trouble. If they trace the robots here, they may have learned who they sold them to, and that would lead them back home. Oh, wait, Luke! He arrives. And... Honestly, they're just some straight burn-to-death skeletons. I'm not trying to be flippant about it. It's stark, it's horrible, it's costly, and it's heartbreaking. But more than just sad, it feels like such a true-life moment. There wasn't some hunky-dory and loving or telegraphed move beforehand. Their relationship ended with them in a fight and angry at each other. You can read the regret all over Luke's face. It's not pure hate or love. It was family. And he doesn't have to say a word that expresses it. Words often get in the way of the most important times. Honestly, the movie already did all the hard work in establishing his complicated feelings. This is the power of good writing. You'll know exactly what the character is thinking in the biggest moment without them having to say it. As Luke experiences emotional torture, we move to the more literal form with Leia and the weird needle robot 
thingy here. What is this thing? I don't, it, I don't know. It's a quick scene, but it also does something important because it gives a sense of emotional space for what's about to happen next. Immediately, we see Luke return, grief-stricken, and we know what he's feeling. We've been with him every step in the way, and here, when he stands before Obi-Wan, he doesn't dwell. He doesn't need any more convincing. He's lost everything. So he says it to him. I want to come with you to Alderaan. Okay. There's also a big lesson here when it comes to the refusal of the call. If you take all of Luke's screen time involved from when he says no to Obi-Wan till he says yes, yeah, it's less than two minutes. I cannot overstate how important this is. Again, the refusal of the call is so much less about the importance of saying no. It's about creating good conflict and valid reasons for hesitance. But I can't tell you how many stories turn the refusal of the call into some knuckle-dragging event that takes up the entire second act of the movie. It's just like you make the story where your character is being this fuddy-duddy who just says no all the time. It's terrible artificial conflict and the audience usually hates it. Again, sometimes it's not even important to have a refusal, but if you do, just be aware of the dramatic purpose involved in it and also learn to make it short when you need to. Also look at 3PO just cold ass dropping Jawas like he's burned millions of them. Jesus. Anyway, we have now reached our point of dramatic synthesis. Luke has joined the team and all four of them are going off on their mission together. Now, they just need to find a way. Sequence 4. Hitch and a ride. Moss Eisley. Few towns have ever received a better introduction. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Okay, uh, we're moving along. We're going to ignore all the bad, unnecessary CGI right here. Now, from a conflict perspective, this is going to be the first time they're going to be coming face to face with enemy stormtroopers. But the characters absolutely want to avoid fisticuffs and gunfights. Don't worry, those will come later. This is all about tension and subterfuge. It's all about being good at blending in, and if it comes to it, pulling out a few Jedi mind tricks if need be. We don't need to see his identification. And note the cool bit of characterization here and the way the film demonstrates how Obi-Wan and Vader have different personifications of the Force, different tactics, different ways that they use the Force. I guess. So now that they've gotten past the stormtroopers, our heroes go to the cantina to find a pilot. Here, we get a now infamous scene. Again, let's stop and ask why. What makes this scene so iconic? Well, it starts with a radical change of atmosphere and we get all these wild, weird aliens. The music playing is jazzy, silly, even a little upbeat and kind of intense. It just makes you feel something otherworldly so immediately. But then, it's the introduction to the characters, right? But think about this. Our first shot of Chewbacca isn't really anything we'd notice at first. We just see Ben talking to some huge hairy alien. Again, this is all part of the way we just organically fall into the story. We meet characters through the ones we already know. The movie is rarely telling the audience how to feel about someone that they don't really know yet. Goodbye, Tarfur. Goodbye, Chewbacca. Ugh. But the scene is also just having a lot of fun. It's doing that prime cowboy walks into a saloon type thing, complete with riffraff giving our hero trouble. Enter these two knuckleheads. Now I understand this is a hugely problematic thing that movies always do when they're like, ooh, ugly people are bad, but my god, these two, I mean, are those balls? Anyways, the real problem is that they're egotistical dickheads looking to pick a fight with some pretty little farm boy. But luckily, Ben is there to try to help and calm the situation. He tries to buy them a drink, and when that doesn't work... Yeah, yeah, I get it. We all know. This is a badass moment. But it's also informative. Obi-Wan isn't just tough. He's calm and careful and looking about for more danger. There's no posturing here. There's no relishing in the violence. He enjoyed no part of that. And after all the hubbub, everyone goes right back such a funny moment that doesn't just invoke the uncaring nature of saloons and old westerns. It works in and of itself. It shows that this is the kind of place where no one cares if you die. Hell, no one even tries to clean up the arm. There's probably a pile of arms dumped out back. But after this bit of characterization, the plot of the scene kicks in. Ben's got a lead. Also, Luke, come on, it's a dick move to grab a bartender's shirt. He's right to sneer at you. So we go outside for like two seconds with these droids, and it lets you know that stormtroopers are closing in. Why do this? Honestly, 
Well, there's the old adage, when in doubt, have two guys come in with guns. But they're not really interrupting anything here, nor does it feel all that oppressive. Really, this is just giving you a sense of tension that they could bust in at any moment. They act like a metaphorical sword of Damocles, this constant threat that's hovering in the air. And it's with that threat that we're introduced to the legendary Han Solo. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't show up till 48 minutes into the movie. But again, that's okay. Just like Luke, this is when he organically comes into the needs of the story. And once again, we have a scene of people arguing and trying to convince each other of something. Han's trying to sell them on his ship in his high price. And Luke, he's ready to bolt. But Ben insists it will do. But tell me, what is it about Han's introduction that works? Why do we like this guy? Well, on a performance level, there's this. My God, Harrison Ford smile, right there. That's the frickin' moment. Just a micro-expression, and it's this movie star shit you can't teach folks. I'm sorry. No wonder they make an unfair deal with this charmer. And with that, they're ready to go. Also, now that we've been introduced to Han, we get the perfect scene to get into his deeper conflict. Turns out there's a price on his head, and Greedo the bounty hunter has showed up to take him in. We also learn this troubling fact that he dropped his shipments at the first sign of trouble. This doesn't just tell us about his self-serving behavior. It's important because it makes the audience feel like he'll drop Luke and Ben, betraying them the first chance he gets. Han and Greedo argue back and forth, and when they reach their own stalemate or dramatic impasse, Han shoots him under the table. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into the whole Han shot first thing. It's honestly one of those details that gets overblown. It's acting like originally Han did some cold ass shit and murked Greedo as he prayed for his life or something. But the main reason the special editions change was so unnecessary in the first place is because Greedo says he's going to kill Han and has a gun pointed at him. The difference really isn't that big a deal. My clunky. Okay, I have no idea what that is, though. But with that murder, Han gets the perfect exit. Sorry about the mess. And after just two scenes, we instantly like this sauntering, smiling swashbuckler. Hell, we even know everything we need to know about him. I mean, can you imagine if they tried to do a whole movie trying to establish what they do here in 10 minutes? Glad they pulled that one off. Now we just jump back to a quick scene of Grand Moff learning that Leia has resisted the mind probe and all the torture. She's a tough cookie, we think. Which sounds weird when you're talking about torture, but anyway, don't think about it. But from this final impasse, Moff knows that something has to change. So now that the Death Star is operational, he's decided to take a new tactic of persuasion. They set course for Alderaan. Guess who is also setting course for Alderaan? Yep. It's our heroes. They take care of last minute details, even selling the speeder at a lower price than they hoped. It makes us feel like everything is going to be a part of the conflict. Like, uh oh, looks like we have a lousy informer for the Empire that looks like an old plague doctor, I guess? Whatever it is, it's really important to keep the propulsion and tension going into this moment, right as the Empire is closing in and they're trying to escape and, uh. <laughs> yeah, there's. Everyone. There's a reason the scene was originally cut. Not just because it slows down the pacing so badly. Not just because it already tells us information that we already know. Not just because the scene is kind of dumb. Not just because the eye lines are a damn mess. But worst of all, this version also makes Jabba feel less dangerous than if they didn't mention him at all. It doesn't work on any level. And look, we'll get into it in the future when we start looking at prequels and sequels, but remember, your story is always what you're serving. I get that Lucas felt like including Jabba after we knew who he was could feel like a cool little addition, but the decision was purely about fan service and meta delights for those already familiar with the movie. The idea that this is now a lasting addition that makes the movie quote unquote better it's an affront to everything that makes the movie good in the first place. Even I get boarded sometimes. <laughs> you think I had a choice? Yeah, let's just pretend this never happened and stick with the original. To that, here's where the scene originally and rightfully begins. So right as that tension's setting in, we get our huge introduction to the most iconic ship. What a piece of junk. Yeah. I want to highlight this because it's such an important tactic for how this movie operates. Luke just appears on screen next to his uncle. Chewbacca is just some alien in a bar. The Falcon is just some ship in the hangar. The cinema of it, that is the camera movement and the music in these moments, they aren't trying to convince us of anything yet. 
It's through the dramatization of the story that we will come to love the thing itself, instead of simply being told why we should beforehand. With that, the bad guys show up, and they gotta make a fast exit. But little do they know, they're on a collision course with the Empire. Dun dun dun. Sequence 5. All roads lead to Alder. Ran, Ron, Ran, Ron, Ran, Ron. They don't even say it right in the movie. Okay, so honestly, what I love about this movie is that nothing is ever easy. Of course they're being pursued by Star Destroyers. But what I like is that we're about to see Han and his element. And there's a sense of fun to everything right now. I mean, he literally says. And of course, you know, like Luke's being super helpful in the battle. But notice how Luke's constant questions actually allow for a lot of exposition in the movie. And here it's important to the understanding of how space travel works in these movies. Is it delivered a little clunky? Yeah, sure. But we're getting it on the fly and the audience is going to need to understand some of this stuff so the rest of the story can just work without explanation. With that, they fend off the Star Destroyers long enough and go to hyperspace, off to Alderaan Ron. Now, that's also where the Death Star is. Now, so far we've seen that Leia has been stonewalling and being badass and all these things, but suddenly things are changing. Grand Moff Tarkin, wait, what is a Moff? I, I don't matter. The second we see him threaten something that she actually cares about, Leia immediately lets her guard down. She begs, she pleads, her cool exterior is gone. This is important because a lot of people make this mistake when they write a character. They think they just have to have one behavior. They think cool, tough characters always have to be icy and stoic and not let people inside. But no one is ever just one thing. If you want to make a character that feels like a whole human being, they have to show a whole range of emotions. And the truth is that vulnerability, it is a strength, precisely because it shows what the character cares about. No rebellion is worth the loss of innocent people. Those who merely get caught up in the wake, the very people they're trying to fight for, so of course Leia gives in. Dantooine. They're on Dantooine. But it doesn't matter. You may fire when ready. What? Our evil Grand Moff Tarkin has been planning to blow up Alderaan no matter what. I want to point out the reason we care about this moment so much. It's not that a bunch of people were killed and that is sad. I think we feel like that sometimes because so many movies treat tragedy like it's math. Like, the more people die, the more we're supposed to care. But honestly, most people don't care about the end of the world. They don't care about characters they've never seen. They care about what they know. And they care about what they've come to love. So why do we care about this moment? We care because Leia cares. She cares so freaking much about her people. We care because it's her home and because she watches on in horror and sadness. Leia gave up everything for Alderaan and still... Still, they have to suffer for this tragedy. We therefore cut back across through space, right to the Falcon. Alderaan is destroyed, and old Ben is immediately reacting. He can feel it through the Force. This is a sad and elegant bit of consequence, one where he didn't know the specifics, but he can just feel it. As if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. But rather than dwell, he also tries to stay on task with the people around him. Which brings us to another scene I really love. Not just because it helps slow things down before all the tension that is to come. Not just because it expands on world building, but because it does a lot of pointed character work too. And once again, it comes in the form of an argument. Luke learns so much about faith, feeling, intuition of the Force. Ben coaches him to trust his feelings, to open himself up. And Han? Well, he sets himself apart. He's a secular average Joe in this universe. He doesn't believe in any of that stuff. Folky religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. The conversation will have to stop here, because they're almost at their destination. And they'll be just in time. The Empire realized that Leia lied about the base being on Dantooine. This is the final impasse. She'll never tell them the truth. So Grand Moff Tarkin gives the orders. Terminate her. Immediately. We now have a ticking clock. Sequence 6. The Death Star Capture. So our heroes come out of hyperspace and learn the grim truth. Alderaan Ron has been destroyed. And they soon learn by what? That's no moon. Terrified, they try to run away. 
but they get caught in the tractor beam. But this is what I love about the entire Death Star sequence that follows. And it's really this perfect way to talk about writing good action. Because whenever I watch modern popcorn movies, it seems like this endless series of whiz-bang noises and jokes made on the fly, and I get it. It's fun, but it's just the texture of fun, because there's very little real tension or sense of danger underneath it. But this entire Death Star sequence? Oh, it's full of traps and reversals and shifts in power and thrilling situations that make the odds feel impossible. Which, I hate to break it to you, is more fun, precisely because it involves the audience on a deeper level. They're not watching passively. And from the second our heroes are captured, they're in this impossible situation, especially when Vader senses Obi-Wan's presence in the Force. I sense something. A presence I've not felt since... They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And so, they gotta figure a way out. And you always start, step by step. Starting with hiding. Note the way that they're not just running around aimlessly and getting lucky. Instead, they immediately begin using their brains and coming up with clever tricks like posing as guards. Give us a hand with this! And from here, they gotta figure out a way to shut down the tractor bream. Um, bream. Bream? Bream is a fish. <laughs> bream is a fish. They gotta figure out a way to shut down the tractor beam, which first means taking over the local station right above the Falcon. With this smart little bit of misdirection, they surprise both the bad guys and the audience. I love that the beginning of this just starts demonstrating them being really good at this. You want things to go right before they go wrong because it instills the audience with a false sense of confidence. Next, they find their objective, the tractor beam. And Ben insists he's going to be the one to do it, and he has to go alone. Even without knowing what's about to happen, he seems to give some words to Luke that make the audience feel like his words will be his last to him. The Force will be with you, always. It lingers with us. But as he sets off on his own objective, luckily, our heroes find another. The princess, she's here? Princess. Princess Leia is in the detention center and they need to rescue her. But immediately Han has no interest and Luke tries to convince him. Again, this is good conflict. The cause of the rebellion? Helping his fellow man? Caring if someone literally dies? Why should he care? She's rich. Aha, <laughs> that's why he should care. Which is of course the only thing he cares about. And we also get it though. He has a price on his head. And we empathize with him in that way too. Even at the end of the scene, we get a smart little bit of foreshadowing. 3PO asks what they should do if soldiers come. Lock the door and hope they don't have blasters. It's a funny terse response, but it matters because they'll come and they will. They arrive at the detention center and they have their whole fake prisoner plan ready to go. But they even set the seeds of doubt in your mind immediately. This is not gonna work. At first, it seems like there's this glimmer of hope, but unlike the last scene, it very quickly goes wrong. Look out, he's loose. It becomes a shootout. They're hitting the cameras and they barely win and there's a sense of danger and urgency and all that good stuff. Han comically tries to buy them time. Everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? I love that little grimace right at the end. I love the fact that he's bad at lying and it becomes this ongoing thing in the series. It's so good. But more troops are gonna come in. We're now stacking the odds against our heroes. Everything begins happening so fast. We get a lovely bit of introduction for Luke and Leia's first meeting. We see Obi-Wan sneaking around trying to find the tractor beam. We have Vader telling Tarkin that Obi-Wan is indeed here and he'll need to find him. We have more troops coming in to get 3PO just as we have more troops coming into the detention center. We call this kind of action spinning plates. Because suddenly we aren't just worried about one thing, but multiple things falling apart before our eyes. What's great about this is we get to see the way character relationships and dynamics play out in the scene that follows. Han and Leia are already sniping at each other. You came in here, didn't you have a plan for getting out? He's the brain! We are! But just like Han's smile before, I love the way we get to see Carrie Fisher's own announcement moment for her stardom. The moment of her grabbing the gun and firing back and going into the shoot, it... I want you to understand that this stuff was a big deal in 1977. There's a reason that Leia became an icon of second wave feminism and a hero to young kids alike. Leia's so damn smart, kind, empathetic, hilarious. A little short for a stormtrooper. And she takes no shit. <laughs> She's a fully realized and fully confident person, a true leader, but sometimes she'll also lead them into danger. Now these kinds of moments have a word in action language, and it's called out of the frying pan and into the fire. Because they haven't gotten away cleanly, now they're trapped in a smelly garbage room with no hope of escape. So they immediately try to fix it by firing the laser, but that backfires, and god, they're in a terrible situation. Could be worse. Oh, 
it's about to get worse. Enter this creepy monster, but god, this is the best dramatic sequence in the film. First, Luke gets grabbed by the weird tentacly thing, and they can't fire because of the beat we just saw before. It's so scary, and the speed ramping makes it feel so weird and off-kilter and unlike anything else in the movie. I always think about how the only reason Luke gets out of the situation is because, well, it's about to get even worse than that. Point is, the walls are closing in. They're going to be crushed to death. It's edited so well with this endless creeping dread, like they're always on the edge of death. How are they ever going to get out of this, we wonder? And the answer is 3PO, of course. Too bad 3PO and R2 have their comm link off and they're hiding from stormtroopers. This is the genius of spinning plates when people are depending on one another, and yet both are in trouble. And what's great about the execution is the film holds off on this delay for the perfect amount of time. It's not too long, but it's still feels excruciating. Then 3PO remembers to check and at the last second, yay! But what I love about the most dramatic, tense scene in the movie, this is really just set up to the best joke. Listen to them, they're dying, R2. Curse my metal body, I wasn't fast enough, it's all my fault. This is the truth about set up and punchlines. They both hold tension and then you relief the tension. Sometimes it's with, yay, we got away, we did the thing we want to do. And sometimes it's great when you hit with a joke. We're all right. you did great. With that, they get out. But still, they have to get out of the Death Star itself. After a quick scene of Obi-Wan avoiding detection and shutting down the tractor beam, we have another reset moment with the characters. Uh, now wait till here! <laughs> It's not just a funny scene, it establishes the dynamics and how they're going to have to listen to Leia. Han has his own feelings about the matter. No reward is worth this. But it also lulls you into this nice sense of complacency before the action comes at you again. So many movies make the mistake of firing action at you with like non-stop noise. I know I keep comparing this film to modern movies, but I'm doing so because the differences are really stark. The Death Star sequence may feel like a non-stop action fest, but it's actually just taking these smart little breaks in between all the intense stuff. So they make it back to the hangar, but right when the bad guys show up, they don't run. Instead... <laughs> Which isn't just funny and unexpected. It's also the very first moment where Leia likes him. Certainly has courage. Meanwhile, Luke and Leia have gotten themselves into trouble. Again, the film just keeps piling up these clear, understandable obstacles. The bridge is out, and now they have to get across. It's cause and effect. And again, pre-CGI, you couldn't just animate this crazy, flowing thing. You had to invent kinetic feeling in the physical space itself. You had to make it work in the edit. But this sequence gives Luke a sweet little hero moment. Good luck. And from that high, we go to a low. Because Darth Vader's been waiting. His ensuing standoff with Obi-Wan isn't some huge argument, nor is it really a thrilling sword fight. But it's weighted with a deep sense of history. We understand the emotion behind their power dynamics, and how they're both coming into this fight with confidence and certainty of themselves. Then he says the line, If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. The line that changes everything. And just when we're wondering what that could possibly mean, he's struck down. Now, you can imagine that in 1977, an audience would feel a little confused. But that's what you're supposed to feel. I understand some sort of implicitly tragic loss here. But we also understand pretty quickly that Ben hasn't died so much as he's vanished into the ether. We even hear his voice just mere moments later. Run, Luke, run. But what is important is the way we are guided by Luke's angered emotions at the moment. No! And more importantly, we stay with those emotions. The film doesn't rush past his sadness. We take a quick but critical beat of Luke being alone and Leia consoling him. This kind of stuff matters so much. It's how you give space and honor the impact on characters. It's where you sense their internal journey. I remember a scene in Star Trek Into Darkness where Carol Marcus's father is killed right before her eyes. She screams in agony, and the film doesn't even reference it again. You have to take a moment to show the impact. And we need to have that moment, even with the enemy still on their trail. With that, four TIE fighters come in flying, and Han and Luke have to man the guns. This isn't really a writing observation, but I have to say... Considering the fact that this is just two actors moving in wobbly chairs against digital effects that Lucasfilm and his team were literally inventing as they were going along, you have to say this is edited really, really well. It's all just basic camera techniques. 
It's following eye lines and using movement against the frame to give a sense of cause and effect. Even R2 has something to do in the sequence by extinguishing the fire. There's a reason after 43 years, the entire Death Star sequence still works like gangbusters. It's because it was all built to be functional on a dramatic level. Most people watch this kind of stuff and never think about it in terms of stacking the odds or spinning plates. They just sit back and enjoy it. But when you're writing the stuff, or you're part of a VFX team designing action, you absolutely have to think about these things in terms of objectives and obstacles and conflict and drama. You can't just sit there and think, hey, you know what would be cool? And I'm sorry, R2 laughing at 3PO struggling will never not be funny to me. <laughs> Sequence 7, Calm Before the Storm. So now our heroes have escaped an impossible situation. Or have they? It seems the bad guys have put a homing beacon on the ship. Now, that's clearly meant to set up some good old-fashioned dramatic irony, right? Where our heroes don't know they're about to get got, but Leia's already on to them. Easy, you call that easy. They're tracking us. So the question is, why? Why make this choice for an immediate reversal on our expectation? I always ask people a question when writing, and it comes down to this. What drama does the audience get out of knowing the information? And what drama does the audience get out of not knowing the information? Because if Leia doesn't know about the homing device, then they just sit there and it's la-di-da until the Empire shows up. But that's not what you're building to with a climax, right? That's more move for early in the movie when you're trying to put the heroes in an unexpected jam. No, this is the final face-off, and we need a reason that the Empire is going to let them go, which is the homing beacon, and it makes sense. And you need a reason that Leia would be onto it. It's the only explanation for the ease of our escape. So it works much better if both sides know the stakes and know what's coming. It's kill or be killed. Which is exactly why Han wants to grab the money and get the hell out of there. Leia has her thoughts on the matter. You needn't worry about your reward. If money is all that you love, then that's what you'll receive. And Luke feels the need to tell her different. I care. Look, I also note that this is the part of the story where it feels like we're definitely setting up some kind of love triangle with bits of jealousy and understanding, but those beats also serve a better function if it's really just about empathy and kindness. Because this movie, it's not ultimately a love story. That comes later. For now, it's a rebellion movie. It's about learning to give a shit and become part of something that's bigger than yourself. Essentially, it's about becoming part of a cause. And with that, we jump right to our cause or rebel base. We see the X-Wings, which right now in 1977 are just cool looking planes to us. We get the technical data and go right into briefing mode, setting up the objective of using small fighter planes to attack the Death Star. Their objective, to get a single shot through a small thermal exhaust port. We set up the difficulty of this task. That's impossible, even for a computer. But we also set up Luke's confidence in the matter. But it's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. Now we have 30 minutes on the clock until the Death Star shows up. A literal ticking clock. But before we jump into action, there's a hugely important scene that needs to happen. It's Han's last choice. Last choints? Last choints? <laughs> it's Han's last cho- I almost did it. It's Han's last choints. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I genuinely didn't mean to do that. Okay, that's going in the blooper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's Han's last choint- <laughs> Jesus, I can't- <laughs> I really, really- <laughs> It's Han's last chance to join them. But he's not going to stick his neck out for them. He has his money now. It's over. But even here in this moment, it's not like the experience hasn't changed him. He likes Luke. He even asks him to come along. Why don't you come with us? Pretty good in a fight. Could use you. But Luke's all in on the cause now. They're at a dramatic impasse. Luke tries one last time, but all Han can offer... Is a callback line. Hey, Luke. Something he knows will mean something to Luke after what happened to Ben. May the force be with you. And he means it. The goodbye lingers in the air, and Chewie growls. But then we get the single most important line in setting up the film's climax. What are you looking at? I know what I'm doing. Yep, that's the line. Because we can hear the hollowness in his voice. We can see that he's trying to convince himself. We can see the doubt. Just as we can see that deep down, he knows better and feels guilty. Which is all so important because it allows us to believe the idea 
that he'd come back. So the ending doesn't feel like some lucky deus ex machina. It's not fate. It's a moment built on meaningful relationships we've seen in the story. It's here, in this moment, that the ending is earned. Because good payoffs always come with good setups. From that moment, Luke feels alone. He wishes Han was coming, just as he wishes Ben was here now. It's such a great note to feel, and then we get the special edition scene where Biggs shows up. It's another one of the feigned deleted scenes that works its way into this story, but I get the original logic of it. It should make us care about this character's upcoming death, a character who originally had a whole introduction back on Tatooine that never even made it into the special editions. But there's a reason all those scenes were taken out in the first place. It's not just pacing that it really doesn't do a great job on selling the audience on caring about Biggs. The truth is, at this point in the story, with Leia and Han and Ben and R2 and the larger cast of the movie, we care about them. So now, putting all this real estate just to make us care about one side character who we just know that Luke knows? The payoff honestly isn't that big. These are just demonstrative scenes meant to tug at sympathy. But there's a huge difference between sympathy for a person we barely know, whose death will go by in a blip, and empathy for the relationships we deeply care about already. Which is why we get a much better part of the scene that comes right after. When asked if he wants a different R2 unit, Not on your life. That little droid and I have been through a lot together. It's a great little moment that summarizes their forged relationship. A mere two hours ago, Luke would have erased the droid's memory without a second thought and done his chores. But now, he and R2 are ride or die bitches. So as much as we could care about Biggs dying, we will care way more if, God forbid, anything happened to that plucky little droid. Gulp. With that, the Death Star approaches. Sequence 8. The Death Star run. Immediately, you feel the sense of David and Goliath. These tiny little ships are going against the moon. Whatever hope could there be? I'll also argue that this sequence is still the best space battle sequence in the series to date. Again, because they couldn't do a ton with graceful, fast-moving VFX, they had to rely and be dependent on clear geography, creating energy in the edit, and really relying on the mechanics of realistic dogfighting planes and aerial tactics from World War II. But the result is spectacular. We start with a good old-fashioned roll call of all the actors who will direct our attention and care. Note the way they basically narrate the action of all that's to come. I'm gonna cut across the axes and try and draw their fire. But quickly, we even start demonstrating the dangers of death and loss. And we start demonstrating cause and effect within the battle itself. The small fighters are evading the laser fire and starting to make dents in the surface. Therefore, the Empire is gonna have to go to their fighters. The battle rages on. And we get reversals. Luke saves his friend, and then his friend saves him. God, even though I've watched it a million times, even though I'm trying to analyze it for this essay, I still just get so involved in the visual story as it unfolds. The battle spins multiple plates. We get Grand Moff Tarkin showing hubris and denying the validity of their attack. Evacuate? In our moment of triumph? I think you overestimate their chances. Which, in a weird meta way, just ends up justifying their deaths, narratively speaking. We also get to see the Death Star move closer and closer. We get to see the incredible difficulty of the rebel ships trying to do the trench run. We get to see Lord Vader himself coming into the battle and take out the rebels one by one, seeming like an unstoppable force. All this works like a perfectly engineered Swiss clock. Clarity. Obstacles. Tension. Because there's the impossible tension of the bad guys closing in. I can't hold them! And also realize the impossible nature of their goal through their failure. Take it in. It didn't go in. And finally, we get Luke, Biggs, and Wedge going in for one last hope for the rebellion. Even when Biggs dies, there's no time to mourn. Then Wedge gets taken out, and it's all down to Luke. And when things feel most dire, tragedy comes for the one we care most about. We're beside ourselves. It's not gonna work. R2 is down. Luke needs to get closer. He hears Obi-Wan's voice. Use the force, Luke. He turns off the computer. Is he making the wrong decision? No, Ben would never steer us wrong. But the port still isn't in range. Luke is still too far out. Vader gets him in his sights. It's, it's over. He's gone. It's failed. So Vader fires and then... <laughs> Every time I forget, I forget this is the moment where Han shows up because I'm too caught up in the action. It's so perfectly timed because we spend the entire battle 
forgetting about Han Solo. And I'm so involved in the tension of the moment that my heart leaps out the second he comes in over the star. And because they set it up so well, we already know why he came back. There's nothing to say. There's only one thing left to do. Sequence 9. We did it! Yay! We did it! Yay! Okay, what I love about this celebration is how genuinely delirious they are. Just big, grinning, goofy idiots who aren't just hugging, they're falling over each other. But they did it. The only thing left to do is celebrate. The truth is, there's no other resolution needed. When you tell a story in the right way, you don't have to keep explaining things postscript. You do all that work before the climax, and if you're really good, you make it happen as part of the climax. Like what happened with Han here and now. You know, Phil Lord always says this thing that I think about, where he says, movies are about relationships. And that's absolutely true here. We've seen that Han came back for Luke. We see that Luke learned to trust in Ben's guidance and embrace the Force. These are the climactic actions of our narrative. The Death Star almost feels like a part of that actualization. There's an old adage in storytelling where you ask, What's the thing the characters could do at the end of the movie that they couldn't do at the beginning? For Leia, it's a bit more plotty, but it's the seemingly impossible task of beating the Empire. For Han Solo, it's caring about something more than money in himself. For Luke, he did it. He managed to leave home. He made a choice to risk everything and become part of a bigger world. He lost a family, but he made friends in a new family here in his story, some of who will be going forward with him. Yeah. The final scene feels like a victory lap. But that's the whole point. Luke, Han, Chewie, and Leia, the wink, all of these details are the final icing on the proverbial cake. But there's a reason the Phantom Menace can copy this exact same celebration and it doesn't feel nearly as satisfying or miraculous. <laughs> we'll get to that another time. But just know it's because you have to earn the satisfaction of your victory through the story itself. And Star Wars earns it. It earns it by committing to the basics. When people tried to copy the success of this movie, they always made the mistake of copying the surface details. They thought audiences wanted space guns and laser beams and... Oh, I didn't think of a joke. Um, <laughs> and insert joke. <laughs> but it's not about lightsabers or any specific iconography. It wasn't even about the rough shape of the story. Because you don't want to have a character die by X page just because other movies do it. Just as you don't copy the beats themselves, you have to look at what makes the beats function in the first place. In other words, you don't learn how to make Star Wars again. You learn what made Star Wars good in the first place. And it was the basics of story. The relatable life situations, the simple goals, the clear objectives, the dramatic conflict, the constant attempts at convincing each other, the focus on economy and ticking clocks, stacking the odds, spinning plates, and most of all, the understanding of setups and payoffs. This film is slavishly devoted to all of these things, and as a result, they created one of the most entertaining and enduring movies of all time. The same is true for all great popcorn movies. They're built on the harmonious blending of clear characterization, plot, drama, and theme. They know how to keep focused on the story and letting all the necessary details come out of what you are already seeing on screen. Couple this devotion to storycraft with imagination, ingenuity, then you have a great idea. But Lucas didn't arrive at this final story with the very first draft. Heck no. It was part of a rigorous will to keep editing, keep shaping, and build a movie that actually worked. That's the secret. Everyone who worked on Star Wars treated the story as the boss. It wasn't lore management. Because in 1977, no one knew what this movie was going to be. It was just an idea. An unformed nothing. And its eventual success proves something so damn important. A good story will take you everywhere. Even a galaxy far, far away. Thanks, and see you next time. Hey everyone, I want to thank you all for the incredible Patreon support on this. Uh, you're the ones who have made this possible. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm actually uh, going to list off a few of the names here as we listen to this beautiful music. That could be like Adam K or... Ben Oslo, or D Flat, or Ian Norris, or Courtney Lilly, or 
M. Hi, M. Or Liquid Ocelot 201. I enjoy your shooting. Thank you to Pylus. I hope you get some pie. Thank you to Sierra Phillips. Thank you to all of you. Like, honestly, I, ca- I can't say how much your support means to this. And, and I'm so happy that you were able to make this a reality. And thank you to Landon. And this is all super fun. <laughs>